All right, Lev, welcome to the interview. Uh, we can just start by you introducing yourself, telling us what you're up to, and then we can jump into some other questions. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me, Michael. Absolute gem. Uh, my name is Lev. I run a, uh, I co-founded an agency called Rhetoric. We are uh, specializing in um, building the personal brands of uh, top executives for like usually like startups or Fortune 500 companies, specifically more about like helping build out the founder-led content strategies for them on LinkedIn, Twitter, and email. And that's kind of where most of my days evolve now. It's just basically just running the business, making sure that clients are happy, and then just always looking for novel ways to to implement AI into the whole process. Awesome. And so I got, I'll ask like two questions like leading into the second question. What what got you like into ghostwriting and then what specifically made you turn towards the kind of like founder led brand strategy or was that where you started or was it the other way around? Did you like get interested in the startups and then start ghostwriting? I mean, I come from a software development background. So I was trained as a software developer, worked in software development. Um, and that's kind of where my life was. But alongside that, I've always had an entrepreneurial kind of spirit to me. I could never see myself locked down to a nine to five. Although, of course, with, you know, software developers, you, you have more leeway and, you know, better pay. So it's like not the worst nine to five to have. Um, but I still, for some reason, struggle with that. So I always had my own thing going on. And that all my own thing was uh, agencies. So I always built Initially, my first business was a website development agency that then morphed into, you know, we delivered the first custom website for a client and they asked, well, how do we get people to uh, to the website? That was the question they asked. And at that, at that point, I'm like maybe 21, 22. And like my eyes open up. I'm like, oh, we need to have marketing, which then got me into learning about marketing. So I've never really formally trained myself in any of these uh, disciplines just through pure like sheer will, interest and like practice. But that, you know, let me down the marketing uh, rabbit hole, which got me involved with my own kind of clients, my own kind of expertise across social media, paid media, earned media, all that good stuff. Um, and then eventually got into ghostwriting because I, I guess my interests have, have just evolved over time, right? Like I just no longer, I despise coding. I'll be honest, like I just, I'm very happy to be away from that life. I prefer copy um and i think yeah i think uh that's what was the second part to the question did i answer oh uh just how like how did you kind of stumble upon this sort of niche of the, the ghostwriting space um are you familiar with a guy on twitter called nicholas cole yes yeah so i saw his video um when he was on a podcast appearance on ali abdal's podcast where it was like titled like how to make millions writing online or something. And at that, at that point in my life, I was just like, I was like, yo, I, I, I could love to learn how to make money online with writing. Uh, that sounds awesome. Because at that point I was doing like freelance stuff still. I wasn't fully like the business side at that point didn't go uh, the way I wanted it to go. So I had like, a, I had my little like kind of dark period. And then I basically transitioned to like a solopreneur where I was just doing freelancing for like copywriting, whatever else that wasn't stable enough for me. So I was like, I'm clearly missing something here. Came across Ali Abdal, came across Nicholas Cole, joined his um, premier Ghostwriting Academy cohort, where then I picked up the kind of missing pieces that I didn't have. And now the rest is history because now I'm making great money online and everything that I kind of was struggling with before, I have much better understanding of what that is today. That's awesome. Yeah. And Nicholas Cole, definitely for anybody watching, would recommend following him on Twitter. Really good uh, name in the space of ghostwriting. The Ship 30 for 32, I've heard, is also uh, very, very good, a very good program. Um, awesome. So you're in ghostwriting now, and then there's AI. So, like, were you kind of like excited about it because, like, you come from the tech background and you're like, maybe I knew about this already? Or when you saw it and you were ghostwriting, how did it, uh, what was like your initial reaction to uh, AI and like what you thought it would do to the ghostwriting industry? And then what is your kind of perspective now? And has it changed at all? 
Hmm. Good question. Great question. I think at the time when AI first came out, now granted, are we, is the starting point like GPT, like chat GPT? Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll be more specific with the question. Like when AI really started to kind of go exponential and it, it started to enter the mainstream and then we saw just a flood of tools and companies and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My first actual use case for GPT and AI in general was actually creating an Alan Watts um, therapist. Like that, that nice. was my first ever, like I didn't care about anything else. I was like, it's so cool where I can have like this, because I'm a, I'm a big uh, believer of like journaling and I love to journal. But, you know, I always found a weird kind of setback where, where like if I journal something, I can never get any kind of feedback from my own, except, except my own thoughts, right? So it's like, it'd be nice if I had this, this kind of someone I can talk to, aka a therapist essentially, right? Uh, but in a more portable version tailored to how I would want my therapist to speak to me. And at the time, Alan Watts was like my kind of go-to person. I always listened to him at night. Um, and I set up this like custom uh, prompt where I was like, you are Alan Watts. You only, you know, reply like Alan Watts. You have, you source your information from all his books and lectures and whatever else. And like, I'm going to ask you questions and then, you know, you'll just like have a back and forth with me. And it became this genuine, like, probably like, you know, knowing now that OpenAI uses our data <laughs> or used back then to train future models, the stuff I said was very... <laughs> It was very vulnerable. I mean, it's like now it's out there. So it's like someone knows about it. But it was that use case for me. It was just like actually like being able to like just genuinely like be able to express myself and then have th this AI bot thing. It became weird. It's like, you know, like her where it's like now it's like when I speak about AI, I don't know how to address it. Like he, she, it like genuinely before it was like a hard it. But now I, I catch myself saying like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm speaking to to my like my AI assistant thing, which is now a he or her. And it's weird because now it's becoming more and more a part of my life, which I, before it wasn't so much, before it was a clear cut, like, yeah, life without AI, now AI exists, but I still don't know how to use it or anything. So it's like, it doesn't really affect me. Uh, but now it's like AI is part of my every single day. And especially when it first came out beyond just the AI chat, but with Alan Watts, it was like, well, now you can do so much with it. Like now you can have idea generation. The biggest kind of like trends were like idea generation was a big one. Uh, instantly blog writing and like things like just copywriting in general that quickly came into the mainstream. Um, so people were really figuring out ways to use AI to write and, 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 and you know, to help amplify their content creation process, which they still do now, right? Um, as to how things change, I would say, like a better understanding of how to use AI more effectively and having learned over the years what it means to like do proper prompting, how like just saying one sentence versus saying it in a more detailed, specific, like action oriented way will change the response completely. Uh, but also knowing the limitations of AI, understanding actually how the whole thing works fundamentally and like not being able to like get ahead of yourself with like, well, this is a cool tool still, it's still, when I, my belief, it's a tool that augments someone's ability. It's not a replacement of anyone's specific individuality or just like core use case of value. There might come a time where that might be a thing for sure, like the whole AGI premise, right? But as of right now, it's purely like if you know how to use AI and it's like you have to now use AI effectively to be operational in this world, just like how everyone has, has a cell phone everyone's going to be using AI. And that's just like a non-negotiable, it's normal kind of thing. Yeah, no. And that like distinction you made too about it, like not, uh, like not being like there all the way there yet. I, it was kind of like, uh, I guess reflecting on my own sort of thought process and like how I thought about AI in the beginning, I think there was definitely more of an over-reliance. Like I overestimated some of the things it could do. Um, and then over time, the you know the like the the like the main faculties kind of shifted back to my brain where i would think about the problem and then sort of be like this manager uh for ai and so i think that's maybe just kind of reflecting on that and i also think that's how i've learned to be more effective with it where like specifically do you think for it, it could be for your personal your personal life or for your business where do you find it to be 
most effective? Um, and I guess also, where would it be most valuable, even if it's not effective there yet? Well, is it? Do you think that the responses from the AI have become worse? I think. See, it's hard to tell because it's Maybe always before. like, yeah, so, yeah. So my 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 two arguments like against each other would be like, either we just got so used to it and became accustomed to it, and now we are starting to expect more and more, and it's just hasn't mm -hmm. caught up yet mm -hmm. um or i know i've seen people talk about how like the model works it's like with reinforcement learning so the feedback that it's getting is from us and i don't know about you but like you said like like i i just sometimes you know my language with the model is not <laughs> super precise it's also you know sometimes could be vulgar mm -hmm. uh and so it's being trained on that so i think um that could have something to do with it uh, but I hope that the future models just continue to improve. Mm -hmm. Overall, I, I still think it's better than the previous version. For sure, yeah. I, I find myself kind of like disillusioned with ChatGPT recently. I've been switching myself now to Perplexity as my main kind of go-to platform, uh, even like considering not even like using GPT anymore and just like canceling my subscription, just because Perplexity provides that kind of additional, you can use different models uh, under one subscription. But your question was like, how do I use it nowadays? So I have kind of four main use cases um, and I wrote them down here. Let me just quickly see if I can find it real quick. Uh, and they're very like five, I guess I have, but they're very much like what everyone else does. Um, so the first one is research. That's huge for me, especially, especially with perplexity. Um, I can really search for topics uh, in a much more kind of faster way that I previously could on Google, for example. So typing in any kind of thing, if I don't know a subject, for example, I'm working with a client on an industry I'm not fully aware of, um, I can get a very nice kind of overview of what I need to know quickly with sources, with proper citations, with the whole kind of umbrella of uh, additional, like I can, my ADHD rabbit hole is amplified with AI because I can really dig in deep quickly, which is awesome. The second thing would be coding um, because it does do a great job with with coding in my opinion especially if you give it like again like component by component like you know piece by piece it does a great job now it wouldn't do the best if you like here's my entire project folder and like fix this line error <laughs> bug on you know line 14 of this of this file it'll probably like not do the best job but again that's i think a very important fact to consider in general is like to use ai really effectively i've noticed you have to really be specific you have to like give it the details and the context and tell it what you want and give it those like constraints and boundaries otherwise that's when things go a bit loosey-goosey and i think that comes from the ai being trained to be you know kind of generalizing information across a giant swath of data so then it's like well what is the most optimal response that will get me the average approval across all people using it and typically that's why it's you get the generic answers the whole like the common uses of words like foster cultivate poise all these things like it's because it's just what's most unoffensive yeah everyone's going to be happy with it so being very specific with it giving it context giving it information to train on and look at and be like this is what i want from you now write me like the first part of that thing that I want from you. And let's go back and forth with feedback. I like this now. Let's move on to the next part. And building it layer by layer has been the most effective way for me to, uh, of using AI in my personal workflow. Across coding, across writing, across research. Therapy I mentioned as the fourth use case. And the fifth one is like just the lulls. It's just literally having fun with it and just like shit talking it or or asking to see, like pushing the boundaries to see if it's, if it's going like, to you know, say something naughty or if I can make it say something uh, more offensive. But that's just for fun. Yeah. No, the, I, I would also, I, I like doing it for the holes. Yeah. Uh, very, very, very fun. Um, I guess I, I had a question, but I forgot that question. So I may switch it a little bit here to kind of talk about like what you're doing now and more specific parts of like how you think about the content that you're helping produce for these people. 
I'm very interested lately with the measuring of the ROI on the content that we make. Just, I mean, before AI, but now also to compare with how AI stacks up against, you know, just organic content. So do you have thoughts around this either just generally for how you like to measure the impact of your content, like the, the results for your clients, and then also how does AI sort of affect the performance of the content? So I think it's good to kind of establish what my role ent entails initially to kind of get a better picture of how I use AI for this, because as someone who is a ghostwriter, it's a bit of a different story than if you are, let's say, a copywriter, just as it is, versus, you know, someone also who writes content for a brand, also a bit different. And the reason why I say it is because when you're working for a brand or you're working for something a bit more of a larger organization that doesn't have that finesse of like someone someone's story at the core of it, then AI does a wonderful job of giving you the kind of quick information, the quick responses that can pass for an article that you can post on some kind of like website. And it's like, it because it, not that many people are going to be actually checking it out as much. And it doesn't matter if it's not as personal because it's just another blog post for SEO and that that's it. So that's kind of where AI really shines in quick output to get yourself going. And for most cases nowadays in my life too, like 60% of what I write it will almost always be like baseline starts with, with, with AI. Like that's the first thing I do. And then I just kind of, then I tweak from there. But when you're ghostwriting for someone else, when you're speaking with a founder, the, the most core kind of element of that entire interaction is the interview process, which is why it feels bizarre for me to be the one on the receiving end, because I'm the one used to be the one who's like always asking questions and learning about the person. But that's really where the, where that, the gem of real, like effective content marketing and organic content comes from those stories, from those kind of moments of mistakes, those kind of uh, random, like, as you're speaking about a question is like, oh, actually it's one thing I remember, you know, I, I spoke with a guy at the bar over Martini and this is how I, this came Like that's the kind of gem nuggets that make good content that stand out from the, the 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 sea of just the usual stuff especially on twitter and linkedin i think there's a bit of a problem there with like now there's so much education first content that it's becoming like the same thing it's like nine tips for this reason or seven reasons why you should cold plunge in the morning or you know five reasons why waking up in the morning is the best thing to do for yourself like the, and i think that's becoming like tedious for people to read because it's like well it's the same shit more or less and everyone says the same stuff and it's like it's the same kind of format and the you know the hooks and the templates everyone uses are very similar and there's a genuine like now a hilarious thing if you zoom out <laughs> that like you'll have ai creating content to be then read by ai bots that will then have ai bots commenting on the said content that was written by ai <laughs> and you have this weird perpetual ai kind of like i don't know what you call that so that's the secret for like humanizing the writing, right? It's like you speak to the person, you extract the actual stories and you can use AI for the baseline because of course, best practices, you want to have a train on like the right format. Absolutely. Like no, no reason not to do that. But then you have to go in and you, and you actually pluck out the stories and you pluck out the, the stuff that AI could not possibly give you because it, it hasn't lived that person's life and you infuse that content with their personality. And that's how you stand out. And that's how you will continue to stand out in the future as well. Yeah. So I'm just like, I'm observing this with what you're saying with uh, the previous conversation I had with Mitchell and also other people I've spoken to and how they are sort of thinking about AI in the content process. And it seems to me still like, again, maybe this changes with, you know, if AGI comes and it's just all powerful. Um, but until then, it seems like the AI is just meant to sort of augment everything around like the human vessel to keep that human creative input there because that's like what's still necessary to like make make it work would that be kind of i don't know if you agree with that i would just love to hear your thoughts on that sort of observation yeah it definitely augments like that's without a doubt that's what i believe ai is um as a tool it's a, just and a, and a, another thing that you use um yeah, I guess AGI is a big question, but you know, too, it's like, that's such a, 
like there's so much hype there that to me is very bizarre like if we were to just quickly sidetrack on a second like there's so many fundamental things that make no sense to me when it comes to ai first of all the, the rapid push to market now is that driven by what that's driven by some sort of you know maybe capitalism maybe greed maybe some other thing stakeholder pressure like the usual stuff sure but like fundamentally i find i find it bizarre for example that none of us know what the fundamental principles are on which the models are trained on like if we wanted to create this amazing tool this let's say agi which is like the next thing that benefits all of humanity shouldn't we all then have a say on what the governing principles are for this AI. Like we know what the constitution of, of America is. Why? Because it's, it's available for everyone to see. So why can't we do the same thing with AI? How can we don't know what open AI has their thing trained on or same thing with Anthropic or, or the rest of them? Like that seems to me a pretty fundamental thing. Like if the AI is biased from the start and it's not ben benefiting everyone, it's be benefiting specific people, which is not what we want. That has always been a thing that always bugs me. Then we are way too quick to fucking put it into deployment and, 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 and integration. Because again, it's like, we don't know how it works. It's a black box theory. Why are we instantly giving it so much power and then just relying on it to, to make decisions? That doesn't make sense to me. And, and, and this whole thing about AGI doesn't make sense because like a human being is so much more than just a collection of like thoughts and memories. And exp it's that there's like so many things that make us human that we don't even fully understand. We don't even know how this 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 thing up here, we don't know how it works. Yet we are trying to build the same version of this in a digital format. Again, makes no sense. So there's, <laughs> I know you didn't ask this question, but just in general, like this yeah. <laughs> infuriates me. No, I would, I would agree. I uh, tend to think there's more to the human uh, spirit than just the logical functions. I do kind of prefer maybe a, a couple step functions more. And if we just chill there, I would probably be uh, quite all right with it. Can I add um, one thing here? Um, yeah. Are you familiar with a guy named Rory Sutherland? No. Fantastic individual. I highly check it. Nick, please, please check him out when you have a chance. His whole, and I, I'm stealing this from him, he says the term not artificial intelligence, but artificial inquisitiveness which I think is a very powerful kind of reframe because it is kind of the, the beauty of, of AI, for example, with research, is that like you can come up with novel synergies of, of almost un, unrelated topics. It's like if I don't mm. know something about X and something about Y, I can ask AI to find a common ground, which maybe would take me a while to figure out or it, because it has so much access to information, it can quickly find connections or analogies or metaphors like it is very good at being inquisitive, but it's not very intelligent if you think about it either, because all it's doing is predicting the next to token off of a very basic sequential, like just like this is the next thing based off this, this is what I think is going to be based off the weights. This is the most probable answer. Like that's not intelligence. It's just kind of just like predictive analysis and, and just guessing. So it's like what we should be using AI for, I think, is like how can we just amplify our own abilities as individuals, as humans, and how can we make how can we make this thing work better and faster? Yeah. And that, in my opinion, will just solve more problems too. I, I would agree. I think you could even say it's uh, augmented intelligence, where we are the intelligence that's augmented. Um, you that's know, right. just kind of the level of mastery is moving up. I've, I think I've mentioned this a few times, to other people, but Dan Shipper has a good article called "The Allocation Economy," which is kind of talks about similar things where it's making humans start to think more like managers. You are more of like a generalist, big picture thinker. And I think that is kind of the general trend of what we've seen from humans when not like worrying about the the base level things anymore as society continues to go on this upward trend. We have more free time, more mental energy to spend on like higher level uh, thinking. Yeah. That's a good point too. Yeah, I think there's a definitely like the, the saying is like, uh, what is it? Um jack of all trades right uh, master of none but still better than master of one i think is the is the rest of that quote so definitely being a generalist in the in the in the age of ai is a big big benefit for sure no 100 percent um 
I guess like so. I'm kind of like coming calling back to what you're talking about. No, no, yeah, it's all good. Uh, The the interview uh, of the founder. So yes, where do you use the like you say you use the AI as like like idea generation? Do you record the interviews and kind of use that to synthesize the notes? Um, Where where's like can you describe like the biggest parts of the process that you use AI with? And um, yeah, hundred percent. I use it almost in every possible chance I have. So for idea generation, I do not use it because it doesn't make sense to do so. Mainly because if you're writing for yourself, it's easy mm-hmm. to definitely be like, yeah, this is what I, I know myself. I know what I want. But when you're speaking with someone else and you're really kind of workshopping the ideas live on the call, that's what that's ha- is happening. So you're really kind of working with the individual, with the founder as a ghostwriter. You're really kind of workshopping the content based off of what they want to talk about, based off of what you believe is the best thing for them to speak about. And then you kind of go back and forth and you figure out the topics you, you write, you kind of discuss what the post will be about. Then I go ahead and I take that transcript and I put it into AI. And then I kind of be like, well, here's the context of, of a conversation. Let's, you know, start writing this, you know, first post. And from there I have, um, if you look at the bottom of the document I sent you, there are, at the very bottom here, I have an example of how I use AI to co-write, co-write with me, for example. And I would have a first prompt, say, like, help me co-write, you know, so a LinkedIn post for my client, review the summary as a variable um, of my call to catch up on the situation. That's kind of, again, definitely, maybe there's definitely better ways of, like, prompt, prompting that, that specific action. But I give it a summary of the call, so it gives a good kind of overall context of what happened. And it gives me some kind of response of a summary. I then follow up with that by saying, okay, awesome. Let's now do like, and then I tell like, I want this post. And I usually specify the hook of what I want. What AI again cannot do very well is it can provide a general idea and like a 60% baseline of where to start, but it struggles with, it, it struggles with like hook creation for some reason. It does not do it well. And I don't quite know why. I would imagine that would be like the first thing it would do well, but it just doesn't. It still goes, it defaults to, to like a kind of generic baseline thing, which no one's going to click on. So you have to do the work of like the most important part of any social media post is those first two lines. So that's very much like the human approach. So usually I would provide the starting point and I say, okay, now this is the starting point. This is the post topic. Let's finish the rest. And it'll go in. And additionally, if I have a client that has work before that I can kind of leverage, I'll provide that as context for like examples. So I'll, I'll say like um, below are two examples, again, in a, in a variable of how client writes mimic his or her writing style. And then the AI will take that context of how they write, plus the word choices and like the format uh, kind of way, along with the summary of the call, along with my initial starting point, and then it'll give me a response. From mm. there, it's a matter of workshopping back and forth, you know, whatever it might be. But usually at that point, I just take that and I just then make it better because that's just like, that's just how you have to do it, at least for now. <laughs> awesome. And, and are there other parts as well? Or is that just, those are the main and, parts? I mean, the research part is like kind of before that, obviously, yeah. as I mentioned. Um, but really beyond that, there isn't that much more that I use AI for in the sense of uh, within the content creation process. A lot of it is co-writing, then it's research from before that, nothing for design. And I also like to give it for, there's a couple different uses. So yes, I have more use cases. For example, in the thing I sent you, um, we have a little like uh, a little bot that I built. So this one, we have a specific bot that we build for each client. The bot is trained on client data. So again, I share the specific like template that I use for that, um, which you can see. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. So that's like the way I would structure the training data with previous examples of the client content. Uh, again, to learn about the topic, to learn about the, the choice of words, whatever it might be. And the instruction set below is kind of like being able to provide you see them all the time. The bot, the bot replies on 
on LinkedIn, whatever else you might see. It's like great energy. I love this post. So valuable. Um, that to me is like obvious it's a bot. So I want to find a middle ground between like a huge paragraph that no one actually would write versus the one liner. So I wrote this like custom kind of instruction set where it replies to a, a post in a very kind of like non-offensive way, because as a, as someone who's a ghostwriter, you don't want to put words in the mouth of your clients, but you don't want to also, but you can have some leeway of like just making sure it's like a response that anyone would say. And that's the goal with this bot is like purely like to provide the algo, algo boosting of like just commenting, um, but easy because you just copy in a copy in a, a post, the, the bot will read it, spit out a response, and then you just take that and you can use it for, for whatever. So that's kind of been most of my use cases um, for AI so far. Cool. So, I mean, if you're down to talk about or ideate on other use cases or things, I, I have some ideas that kind of like came came to mind. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, the, well, the first one that was popping in my head was kind of like I started to think about, you know, how else could AI be used for uh, helping you deal with the profile of your clients? And I don't even think this is necessarily like a custom tool you need to make, but you could just use like a second brain app and and have like a shared account with the client so they could put all of their notes in. I, I guess I'm trying to say like something that is more of a, like a, an, a swipe file of the client's like personality, but it's more alive. Like you can search for things on the, on the fly and kind of have it pull up different aspects of the client. Like, Oh, what was that? Like, what, what are some quirks about them again? Like, like, you know, um, I don't know if you've thought about that or looked into any like second brain apps that might do the job. I mean, I think notion actually might be like Q and a. Yeah. Notion would be one that I can think of. What other ones though would work? Uh, I think, I mean, for if you wanted to share an account, I don't know. If, I think Mem AI, Mem AI is more uh, like I see people that use that for Twitter. Like, hey, like save this note, save this. It, it's good for calls. It's kind of like one of the more like OG second brain mm -hmm. platforms. And so they've but been. How would that work though? So you're saying that they would also like we would upload documents and stuff, and they would also be able to upload stuff, yeah. documents, and have that as the training data. Or no, just just as like a way for you to reference the client's mm -hmm. profile more easily, so you don't have to like go through everything, kind of sift through. Because again, like I don't know how you structure their well, profile. We have like just wikis, wikis. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah wiki. So like if it was a, like a wiki that was you know AI searchable, essentially. Hmm. Um, just yeah, just an idea. Good. That was that was the first thing that popped in my head. So yeah. I mean, also like now, I I used a platform before called BotPress. I have not heard of that. Um, and it does a similar thing where like you can upload a bunch of documents, data, even a website, and it will just scrape it all. And then you can ask it questions and it'll respond based off that. So in mm -hmm. theory, you can have a chat bot as well that just interacting with the content information. It's like, hey, you know, if maybe someone doesn't know the client very well, it's like, who who is this and what what are they about? And the bot will be able to give you a response quickly, and that way you can kind of uh, pull out like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. what was that like? You know, what are the principles that he you know believes in the most or something? That could be interesting. There is another tool actually. Like I think you could. This might be possible because you said you like you have you train a bot on all of your clients' data. There's a company called Delphi AI. Um, they they basically let you connect every social account, everything you could find on the internet and put it all into like a chatbot has voice, like you could train your voice on it. Uh, it's kind of meant to be like for thought leaders and entrepreneurs and creators to like scale their like interactions with their fans, but I'm sure it could work for your use case as well. If it's like yeah, absolutely. everything, um, I can send you that. I'll also put that in the description for anybody interested. Um, I should also it, mention though, real quick, sorry, when you give data to a, to a, a bot you have to make sure you have a permission or and b the the content is not confidential because otherwise uh, it'll be in deep deep shit yes no yeah like you have to like consent like when you use the platform like they'll ask you do you consent to this 
but even um, what i'm saying even with just the stuff that you know i use oh yes stuff, yeah that like, that would also make even with ai open oh, you know, chat gpt whatever it might be like you have to make sure that you're double checking your your sources and not giving something away that otherwise could get you in trouble yeah um the other idea because i just did this with uh did, did you see meta released their latest open source model llama 3 uh, so I, I, again, it's not perfect right now, but the, the goal of it was essentially to generate a newsletter draft that is more in my writing style and voice, just off the rip, just zero shot, just ask the, ask the model to do that. So I scraped all of my previous newsletters and created just like a custom data set of instructions and outputs to fine tune the model. So again, I don't know if it's you know, is it juice? Is the juice worth the squeeze for you? I don't know. Definitely. Uh, but did I'm you just like the response it gave you. Uh, I I did actually, yeah. Because I what I did after that is I would go to Claude or ChatGPT and just use the same prompt that I used for the the fine tune model. And so it was just the most basic, like write a newsletter about this. Mm -hmm. And I compared Claude to the and again. It's very subjective. Like you'd have to know your own writing style. There's not necessarily. I'm sure there's ways you can quantify the writing style, but it, again, it's, you know, it's that humanness, it's, it's you. So only you would probably recognize you inside the writing. Mm. Um, so potentially just something you could experiment with if a client was open to it, like, Hey, can we fine tune this model on you? And then you just tell me if it actually, does it actually sound like you? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another thing came to me actually recently that I didn't discuss as a, as a use case, but we're we're looking into it, which is um, AI video avatars. Mm. So we're working with a partnership potentially with a with an, with another company that actually does this. Um, and so what we're looking to probably do in the future, if it all works out, would be to effectively have, as we know, like with unfortunately you can't you can grow with text based only content, but you would need to realistically have a more dynamic profile so you need to have uh graphics and you need to have video right so but you have to remember that you know most people when you when you're actually working for someone they and most of our founders are usually like topic top, top executives so they have no fucking time and they don't have energy to be looking at different platforms or whatever else or even doing videos or or no one's like very few people are like alex from Mosey where like they know that this is what needs to be done. And I'm going to like batch create my videos on, on like this day or here it's all like a big system. Like people don't have that. So we thought it'd be cool to try this AI video avatar thing. It does a very good, like realistic job of like mimicking yourself. And then you can just give it a script and it will, you know, it will just genuinely make you look like as if it's, it's, it's who you are. Now I do wonder though, if there's going to be some backlash, because I do wonder still do people, fundamentally hate other people who use AI, especially if it's in such a visible way of like, that's clearly not Lev. It's his AI version. And I hate him for doing this. I, I, I just curious. Yeah. I think, uh, no, I have a, I have a couple of thoughts on this. I think like, again, for me, like my goal is not to replace the human because the human sucks. My goal is to like the way I see the content game essentially is in the way it's just sort of going is it's almost like just a necessary evil mm. it's like the new ad network of the internet like you just have to constantly keep a pulse and so mm. maybe that's draining your energy where you could be spending it like connecting with people that are you know deeper down the funnel in your community if you're a creator or you know working with your clients if you actually have a business outside of the content you make and so i think it would be it's going to be more expected i i think like which may, you know, like the expectations and reality will be more lined up. Like they're like, oh, you know, like this is kind of just the way it is now. Like everybody's doing this. Um, and you're right though, because like, again, my entire business is built on like, we help you build your personal brand online and we are just seeing an influx of interest. So like the demand for it has never been higher and it's only going to keep increasing. So definitely people are waking up more and more to like the value. Cause again, if you think back to like 2015, 16, you, we would have a very distinctive social media of like, this is my profile and this is my brand's profile. And we would never mix them. 
Although you had the Gary V still, who was like, guys, you guys just put it all together. But it's like, still, it was like different. Then eventually it's been merging, merging, merging. And now it's like, I think we finally hit the point where like everyone just sees the personal brand as the most important with the association of your business being the secondary, like, this is me and this is my business. And, but this is all about me. And this is like, you know, just so you yeah. know, kind of thing. Yeah. And so that's what is that trend, which is why the focus is going away from education first. It's still, it's still prevalent. Don't get me wrong, but it's more of that, like, you know, here's me, like, just here's me drinking my coffee and like thinking about this business meeting and like, what am I going to say? And I'm having a moment of like, you know, imposter syndrome, but you know, even though I'm successful, it's like, this is still how I feel every single day or like you still, people want to see more of like the actual element yeah. of like, I'm just a, a human being like everyone else. And this is my life basically, but that's very hard to do. It is it's very hard to do. I think, and it's not necessarily like I would, con cause in my head, I'd have like the buckets of content being like entertainment and education. But what you're saying kind of makes me think there's like that. There's, there's three... like that. Yeah. There's the third I'll, I'll lay it. This is what I was going to call it is like, it just sounds to me like there's, it's like authenticity insights and anecdotes. Is like mean, kind of... We break it into um, life career advice, domain expertise and trend news. Yeah. That also yeah, because that trend news is like you know like what's going on in my in my per, like perception of what's going on in the world today. Mm -hmm. Domain expertise is like your personal Category. anecdotes, your yeah your stories, like either because you had the experience you could talk about it, or because you have experience with a certain domain and you can talk about it in more of like a casual way. Um, that is interesting though. Yeah, like being authentic is something I've noticed that a lot on YouTube as well, like with the the raw videos and again maybe it's just the bubble i'm in but um you know you see it with the educational creators and just off the top of my head because he's the biggest person that people will probably know is sam solik blew up super big uh just kind of being an authentic person and i think there's definitely a craving for that because that's i guess like maybe people associate that with being human like not I perfect so. yeah I, I think it's just like it's similar to how like we have a subscription fatigue where like mm. everything is like now a, a monthly reoccurring bill that you're just like sick of it. And all of a sudden now you're seeing like a, the, the, res the resurgence of one-time payments. Mm. And you're like, oh my God, it's like, no, but that was what it used to be. And so before we had just like uncut raw footage of people just like janky kind of like potato quality videos and people were like, that was content. Then it was like, you know, as always you overcorrect on one side and it's like now it's super polished and like the mr beast i guess the, what, what are they call the beastification or whatever yeah vacation of like content and that became now too much and now it's like a, going back to like i guess a, a happy middle of like you still want to have high quality but you don't want to try too hard almost yes um, and i actually have this quite of a, an interesting kind of um feedback from clients like do i have to post every day like do i because then it's like they feel like it's too much and that's that's a that's a tough question to answer because like in theory yes because the more you post that's just the game like you have to be like you mentioned yeah consistent and if you if your goal is to grow an audience online it is very much like how long can you stay in the game that determines your success yes um, second being like your quality of content i i was also going to add with the do i have to post every day this is i think my my thoughts on this are I think that you you have to in the beginning because of just the reality of the like the algorithms and the volume of all of the content on the internet and then i think once you get to a certain point like um who's it like james clear he doesn't tweet a lot but when he tweets everybody's like oh like like yeah. he tweeted uh yeah. but it's about like you you didn't see all the time like all the work that he just put in before that just putting out content doing it just trying it's like yelling into the void until somebody finally hears you uh, and then more people hear you and that that just goes down to like what are your ultimate objectives um which is why this conversation is more of a general kind of approach because again if you're writing for yourself the way you would use ai would be different for how you would be using it if you are writing for someone else right and my whole thing is i write for someone else using ai so it's like that comes down to like well what are their objectives do they want to just grow online if so, 
specific rules that we have to follow. If the goal is to attract attention of, you know, a specific group of people so that they can, you know, usually like it's to get more investors curious about their thing for more funding in the future, that's a different kind of objective. If it is it to drive sales and traffic to a product or a platform, that's a different way. So like you have to modify your content because when you're doing organic, the only thing you can, you can control is the messaging. That's really beyond nothing else. So it's like, how can I then create the message that will lead me to the result that I want? And if it's a specific action, then I have to make sure to have the beginning of a funnel in place, which is like some sort of like link that leads them to the next continuous step. So it's like the first step will be top of funnel with my organic content. And then I get them somewhere if I have an objective to do that. Otherwise, it's just, you know, just content, at which point then you don't have to post every day, because if you just want to be kind of more active then yeah, three or four posts a week is better than most people would do. So that's already a win, right? So it's very specific on what you ultimately want with, with this kind of organic. Content. Yeah, keep keeping the goal in mind is definitely again i think it's becoming increasingly more important you know especially like going back call back to the over reliance on ai is like if you you're you're giving the goal to the ai too it's like you're not even you're just kind of there pushing it along and in, in no direction so um definitely having a goal helps a ton i'm trying to think if i had any other ideas uh i i, I will say I, i'll send you a bunch of i talked about it on the last uh call a bit like the the meta prompt with anthropic so i won't talk about it here but i'll send you that uh and like tell you what it is um do you use perplexity at all i do use perplexity i find yeah i was gonna say for research i i love perplexity for just honestly the ui because it's it's it, it you can just sort it yeah. is it good depending on what i'm trying to find yes <laughs> uh some of the like uh kind of slept on features in my opinion one of them is the the focus uh toggle where you can just search reddit or youtube i think that is i think that is huge like if i'm trying to find problems that people are having or anything like that i think that is amazing um but yeah that i do use it but i to be honest only just for kind of like going down rabbit holes to be honest uh, but if i have other ideas i'll probably just go find it myself because it's not i don't know i think it's like the the novelty has worn off and i'm starting to kind of see the the blemishes uh you know it's okay it's didn't really understand my question there uh it's why does it need context to this i just told it what it was yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, like why <laughs> um only five pro searches because i'm not paying for it uh <laughs> that kind of stuff um I am getting more interested now into like the automation of the workflows that I'm doing. So, so, so part of that right now is like with, with research a bit, I'm using like Airtable and having a, like creating a form where it's like you submit a newsletter idea, you kind of give some notes about what you're trying to do with the newsletter. And then it's going to use like the SERP API. It'll generate a query, pull it in and then load all of like, we'll scrape all the URLs, pass it through open AI to then also add like the key insights and summaries for all of the content that was collected. So I think that is kind of where my head's at now is like, how can I start to remove myself more from the actual, like, again, the, the grunt work of it. If, if the results aren't as good, then yes, I can go and do it again. But on the whole, I think for the most part, it's going to be quite all right. Um, for your own personal content creation. Yes. For, for my own personal content mm -hmm. creation. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's also like AI specifically is amazing if you have an actual product and or some sort of like e-commerce store, because mm -hmm. the amount of SEO that you can like ramp up quickly is insane. Like that is actually one of the best uses of AI today is like just like you mentioned, like you can have it uh, write a full on article, uh, add all the different like affiliate links, make sure it's you know, keyword optimized, like you can really make proper articles, like a shit ton of them on a daily basis, basically. And I know, I know Google right now is having a whole like battle with like AI content and there's a whole thing there, but still like it's a um, massive opportunity for that. Uh, if you have some sort of thing that you want to have more reach uh, 
organically, then definitely that's a, that's a big use case. But yeah. for personal content, that's tough because again, like yeah, it's you have to know. I guess that makes sense for ecom. Like you're uh, not not like in a negative way, but if it's more of a like just product business, the yeah. volume is probably something you focus on because it's kind of like a dime a dozen. Like it's just cheaper advertisements for you, I guess. Like if it's okay. 80, 20 principle, you're just pumping that onto TikTok, pumping it onto Facebook ads. Uh, so definitely, yeah, the goal, the goal matters. You're not necessarily worried about people thinking, oh, I can't believe that person's using AI because exactly. it's the business. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's under yeah. the brand name. It's like, well, that's what it is. What it is. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, that is an interesting point. Like people, how do they feel about AI being used by people? Like you're being deceived. I think there, there, there might be, you know, some like, uh, like social contracts, maybe hope in an optimistic future where you're just saying like, side note, you know, like 60% of this was made with AI, um, stuff like that. Maybe platforms kind of integrate that, like they're able to scan and actually tell which parts were generated by AI. I mean, it's like, it's like similar to how, like, for example, we have to do like hashtag ad in the headline, if it's an ad, like that's the rule. So I'm sure there'd be a similar thing where it's like, if you are using AI, you have to like write something of that sort where it's like you label it that this was AI content, just so you know. Kind of thing. Yeah. Do, do you have any other questions about like, uh, like ideas that you were thinking about that you wanted to talk through? Because I'm trying to think or pull up other ones. I I know how AI can potentially replace me in the future. That I can that I can speak to, because I was thinking about my specific role, and again, a lot of what you do as a ghostwriter tends to be, you know, human driven. It's like it's the conversation, it's the banter, it's the relationship you build with somebody, but it's also specifically like being able to extract the ideas from someone, which is like I think the fundamentally most difficult thing. Like even if someone says like, oh, I can use AI to write something, it's like yeah, but what are you gonna write about? And that's where they get stumped. It's like, well, I'll use AI to make ideas for me. And again, you get like some generic BS that like everyone has a post on and you're just part of everyone else's. So your role as an interviewer becomes very fundamentally important in this kind of sea of AI by being able to extract those insights and opinions and questions and the, the right stuff from the person's mind. That's how you make the more organic content. But in the future, I mean, you could technically just have an AI be really good at asking those kind of questions. And then the person just simply puts them in, right? It's like the AI, it's like a chatbot interface. Now, again, we are being kind of like pigeonholed because the, the first thing that we think of when we think AI is we think chatbot, but that's not accurate because AI is so much more powerful than that interface that we're currently limiting ourselves to. Like we, it's hard for us to think of other, other, other things as a layman because we're like, this is what we are accustomed to. But for the for sake of this kind of hypo, uh, hypothetical, yeah, it's like an AI that could just answer, ask questions. The person can just type them in versus, you know, saying, or maybe even just say it, uh, same thing, extract the uh, transcript, and then pull, pull that information from the transcript into some sort of like predefined best practices for like social media creation, whatever, spit out a response, and then the person on the other, like the founder can like look at that and like modify it. And that's it, good to go. It's like, that takes a big portion of what potentially could be the role of what I do as, as, as a ghostwriter, just completely into the AI's hands, right? Yeah, so I think a lot of room for many use cases, basically. <laughs> well, well, I was actually gonna say, ask that, I'll ask this question after, but the, the other one, I think, you know, there might still be people that, again, it, it comes back down to time. So if there are, like it, it would be, I guess, like more of a high ticket thing, like because it's the the market might may shrink a little because maybe there's like scrappier founders that are like, look, I can't pay for this right now. I'm just gonna have to yeah. like ask it myself. Um, but also, you could kind of have you thought about capitalizing on like training founders how to ghostwrite for themselves using AI. Well, most of the time it's because they don't have time to do that or they don't yes. want to or or Actually. they don't like writing. So it's like they wouldn't really be wanting to do that part anyways. Mm. Um, Maybe training ghostwriters? Ghost yeah, writer. that's where you can train the chatbots on the 
client data to give you better responses so that when you come in post call with them, just leverage those like chatbots that already have the knowledge and previous calls, whatever else. And then you can just start pumping out more content that way. I think there's probably something again there and that's kind of how we use our bots now, but granted, I think there's much more room for improvement, um, especially with the tweaking of the prompts. I think the hard thing there is like just not knowing, not being able to measure as effectively which prompts are better than the other prompts. Like, you know, like knowing yeah. how to prompt engineer. Um, but it's just, I guess, practice and time. You know? mm. Iterations, the usual. Yeah. Well, I don't have any other ideas. I, I, I do just want to ask like at least like one final question then. Like if you think you... Like there's a potential that you'd be replaced, which it, my own opinion is, I think people would still want humans for the I human so reason cool, yeah. as well. Like I, I just, I, I call it, it's like whole foods, like it's more expensive and it's, you know, less efficient maybe because you're spending more resources or money to go get this organic food, but it's, it's better for you. Maybe it's a little overpriced, but mm -hmm. it's like a status symbol now too. Like I have a human, uh, I, I'm paying, I'm paying a human, um, <laughs> Uh, but, but like, so like, what, what do you think, what else would you kind of like do if it wasn't, um, ghostwriting? Would it still be AI related? Would it be? If I wasn't ghostwriting, I would find a way to sell feed pics. No, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. realistically, honestly, I, I love what I do. Like, I really can't see myself doing anything else. Like if I can be a hundred percent honest, like I absolutely, like I wake up That's in the morning perfect. and I fucking love what I do. Um, and it would be something to do with writing, if anything. So, yeah, I mean, hard to say. Like, it's like it's like Zuckerberg's story, where like you know he was offered the the one billion dollars to sell Facebook, and his reasoning for not selling was because he's like, well, I would just make another social media company, and I like the one I have now, so I'm not gonna sell this one. Yeah. So I think it's the same thing here. I just end up doing something similar. So it's like that's yeah. I love that answer. Um... I do also want to ask where can people find you? Twitter they can find me mainly on my LinkedIn and my Twitter. Uh, that's going to be where that is. And also you can of course go to the website, which I'm sure you'll have in the yes, description. I'll, well. I'll put it in the description. Yeah. Awesome. So, thanks man. Yeah. This, this was, was, I enjoyed this. This was awesome. This was uh, very fun for me as well, because I'm not used to being interviewed. So I feel like <laughs> I felt genuinely, I felt a little awkward. So I'm sorry if it came across as a no. little awkward. You didn't come across awkward at all. So uh, I'll, I'll just end the recording. And yeah, thanks for watching, whoever it is at this at the very end. Peace. Thanks. You're the real one. Yeah. <laughs>